Good morning, Vertical Life. All right, the sun is shining and it's so beautiful, and we're going to enjoy this day of celebrating and rejoicing the Lord. Amen. So turn to your neighbor right now and say, boy, has it been a week. But God's got it. All right, so we have a few announcements. We've got some excitement happening. Prayer night. Who needs prayer? Everybody know where the new property is? You're catching on because I didn't hear any Jesuses. Third, fourth, and fifth grade can meet at the new property at 5 p.m. on Friday. Does everybody have that? Okay. And then uh, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth is going to meet at 7 p.m. Is that exciting? Okay. So everybody turn to your neighbor and say that's super exciting. God is in full control. All right, so we're going to take this time right now to, to unwind and get our minds uh, just cleared out and allow for the Spirit to enter in. And uh, we know that these weeks have been troubling and trying on, a, on us all the time. You know, by the grace of God, He's given us a seventh day to rest, to reset, realign, in. Through all the chaos, through all the waves that hit, you know, we get we get knocked off course, we get off path. And the Lord is so patient, He's so gracious that He's sitting there with His with His hand out and He's waiting for us to realign with Him. And right now we're gonna we're gonna start that time. This is a time that we can dedicate to the Lord. Only not only to uh, to lay everything that's been going on at his feet and hit reset. But also, this is the first day of the week, so we're gonna we're gonna start our week off with dedicating it to the Lord, and uh, just like our tithing, everything that uh, everything that we have, we want to give Him our first. And so, as we lift our hands up, we're gonna ask the Spirit to uh, to help us realign. Lord, we just uh, we thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank. 
thank you for your, your patience. And uh, Lord, we want every fruit of the Spirit that you have to offer. Lord, we know that your intentions are not for us to live in sickness and in darkness and in pain and misery and suffering. Lord, you want us to be prosperous and whole. You want us to just understand the meanings of your love. You want to dig us out of any areas of our life that we have dug ourselves into. And Lord, right now, whether it's finances, whether it's family, whether our kids are troubling us, whether we're struggling with being a parent, whether we're struggling with coronavirus, we're struggling with, with just hate in the world that is trying to intervene into our lives. Lord, we lay that at your feet right now. That one thing that has really been getting to us this week, that one thing we lay down right now. Lord, as we lift our hands to you, we invite your spirit to come into this place. We invite your spirit to overflow. That all we see is you and your joy. That we can rejoice in the, in the peace that you give us. Lord, we dedicate this time to you. And we just ask that, uh, that you just enter into this place. In Jesus' name. morning I just want to say we're thankful you. we're thankful you're here we're glad you decided to worship with us this morning um, at vertical life church I just want to lay it out there first thing before we get started we want you to worship how you feel if you want to worship if you want to stand and raise your hands if you want to clap if you want to dance if you want to come down front and kneel before the Lord you worship how the Holy Spirit leads you this morning okay
surrender it today. Oh, make me whatever you want to do, Lord. Make me your offering. So make me what you want me to be. Lord, I came here with nothing but all of you for even me. So Jesus, give me everything. So Jesus, bring Lord, we lay ourselves down on this altar before us in the spirit, God, our lives are a sacrifice of praise. God, we give ourselves to you because you are worthy and for no other reason, God, but you are so good. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for the demonstration of your love through Christ on the cross. We thank you for all who've gathered here today, God. We know you have a purpose in mind for each of us. Nothing happens by coincidence or happenstance, God. You've ordained before time these moments to encounter your presence so that we can encounter your goodness. God, we lift you up. We praise you. We thank you for being here with us. Now open our hearts and minds as we hear the word. Speak, Holy Spirit. Draw us close. Plunge us in your presence, O God. Reveal yourself in a way we've not seen or heard and give us a new inspiration to be filled with awe and wonder of the glory of the creator God who reigns on high. We thank you, Jesus, for your friendship and for your sacrifice. We thank you for walking through deep waters with us. And even in the crushing and in the pressing, you don't let us be left there, but you work all things together for our good. The master builder is creating a wonderful work, and you'll complete that work because you're faithful. We just praise you in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. So many new faces today. We are honored and privileged that you came to spend some time with us this morning. We at Vertical Life Church believe everyone matters to God, and so you matter, and I hope you feel that as you've come to gather with us today, and uh, we, we so much appreciate that. Uh, hopefully you were able to stop by the VIP table and, and get your swag bag. We got some goodies in there and some information about the church, um, and, uh, and we hope that today is a blessing to you. We are having some technical difficulties, so bear with us. There might be some ringing and things, but we're working our best to, to be able to uh, provide good sound for you this morning. We are in Exodus chapter 3, if you have your Bible Uh, which you should have a sword with you. If not digitally, you should have a copy of it with you because I could say everything false today and without the word you would not know it. So bring your Bible, have it with you. It is the sword of the Lord and it's vital. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it is vitally important you have a copy of the scriptures. If you don't have one, come see us. We have New Testaments here that we can send home with you to, to get you going. So, uh, but the YouVersion Bible app is completely free. If you have a smartphone, you can download that and have every translation of the Bible available to you. We also have our notes for the message on that app so you can follow along. Um, and also in the worship guide, there is a section for you to uh, take notes on the back to refer to later. We are in this series we're calling The Great Romance because that is what the Bible is. It is a romance story that begins with a father creating a family for himself those children wandering away in disobedience, saying, God, I want to go my own way. I want to do my own thing. Death, destruction, havoc, pain, and suffering is unleashed on the world. And so the father sends his one and only son, the begotten of God, the unique in the one unlike anyone else, sends Jesus into the world to rescue the children that walked away and cultivate a bride for himself so that you and I can spend an eternity in perfect uh, communion and relationship with God forever and forever. And the story of the Bible is how God not only created and what his will is, but it's the story of how he is rescuing his fallen creation, how he's rescuing us to draw us back into his heart and into his love. It's an incredible love story. 
And we are now in Exodus chapter 3, beginning to get into the story of Moses. Last week, uh, the, the message is online for those of you that may have missed it, but we talked about how Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophet prophesied in the Old Testament that would be like Moses, who would come and deliver Israel, who would be the deliverer, the uh, Messiah that would save his people from their sins. And today we're getting into the story of Moses to kind of look at other revelations that this story has for us, what we can glean. And so we're going to begin reading in Exodus chapter 3 in verse 1. And in the Bible, it is recorded, One day Moses was tending his flo- the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. It, he w- was a prince of Egypt. He sinned. He murdered an Egyptian, and he fled into the wilderness for his life. He um, stumbled on some shepherds. There was an incident there that... Uh, allowed him to be invited into Jethro's home. He marries one of his daughters. And now Moses, who was a prince of Egypt, is working as a shepherd in the land of Midian for his now father-in-law, Jethro. So he's watching the sheep for his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. Now, I don't know if your brain works like me, but I see a lot of humor in this passage of Scripture. Because if I was on a mountain all by myself, and I saw a uh, bush on fire, I probably wouldn't think much of it. Let alone if someone started to speak to me out of the bush, I would no longer be on the mountain. I'm gone. I'm gone. But here Moses sees this bush on fire. It's, it's lit and it's not burning up. And he has this interesting conversation with himself. He's like, hark, what is this I dare see it? It is a b- b- bush on fire. I think I'll go check it out. <laughs> you know, and just walks on over and, and checks it out. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Like, if you think about it, it, you know, I think God is so funny. He's got a lot of humor. But this is what happened. Verse 4, it says, when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am. Again, kind of an odd response, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you. They will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, And the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Yahweh. And after this conversation, Moses protested again in Exodus chapter 4, 10 through 12. Moses pleads with the Lord. He says, oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never been. I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled then the lord asked moses who makes a person's mouth who decides whether people speak or do not speak hear or do not hear see or do not see is it not i the lord now go for i will be with you as you speak and i will instruct you in what to say 
a monumental moment for Moses, but a cataclysmic moment for the people of Israel. In this story, it kind of reminds me of that old children's story, The Engine That Could. Does everyone know The Engine That Could? Most of the people my age and older should know it. Some of the younger kids may not know it. But the little story of The Engine That Could is this little engine who is tasked with carrying this load uh, down the railway, and he comes to this mountain that's really steep, and the load is really heavy. And he starts to panic a little bit, and he's not thinking it's looking good for him to get over this mountain. And so he starts telling himself, I think I can. I think I can. Somebody say that. I think I can. I think I can. And he starts telling himself that to the point where he begins to believe it. And he, as he's going up the mountain, he's encouraging himself over and over and over again until he crests the mountain, makes it over, and celebration is had. He, he's so excited that he made it over. And the, the moral of that story is don't give up. Don't, don't be afraid of incredible tasks because you can do more than what you believe oftentimes. And I think in this story of Moses, I th and I think a lot of us, we share situations that are in common with the little engine and with Moses, except there's a little caveat. Most of us start out in life looking at the mountain thinking, I can, I think I can, I think I can. And we even start up the mountain, and we're excited because things are going well. But then something happens to take the steam out of the engine. And rather than going up, we start sliding back down. This happened in Moses' life. He's a prince of Egypt. He's the general of the Egyptian army. He's famous. He's wealthy. He's rich. He has everything going for him. He even knows that God prophesied over his life that he would be the deliverer of Israel. And a day comes where he sees the Egyptians dealing harshly with an Is Israelite slave. And he thinks, I'll begin this deliverance now. And so he goes and murders an Egyptian in cold blood. And he hides the body in the sand thinking nobody saw him. And the next day, when he tries to settle a dispute with some Hebrew slaves that are fighting, they, they rebuke him and say, what, are you going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? Who are you to tell us? what to do. How morally superior are you when that's the kind of person you are? And he thought, oh my gosh, everyone knows what happened to me. And he flees for his life. This man who had everything going for him, everything was good. He was in the prime place to be this significant person, now flees to the wilderness where he loses his family, he loses his friends, he loses his his name, he loses his reputation, his wealth. Everything is gone in a moment. He ran from his calling. He fled for his life. He had to measure up. He couldn't measure up. He'd find the confidence to measure up to other people's expectations. And here in this moment, as this fire is burning and God is speaking to him, his response to leadership is different in the wilderness after spending 40 years in the wilderness. His response to leadership is different in the wilderness than it was in Egypt. He went from, I can do no wrong, to, I can't do anything right. There's nothing in me, God. I can't do it. You see all these problems I have? I can't be the one you're calling me to be. And now this mountain set before him, going back after 40 years, it's this, this fear of facing what he did, wondering if people still know, still think about the things that he did. How can I go back and face that failure? This mountain before him and this attempt to fulfill this God-given calling that is not only remarkable, it's spectacular, seemed a step or a steep to climb, a too big to climb. It was too much for him. What I see in Moses and what I even see in my own life is that when your confidence is placed in yourself, your value is dependent on your performance. When your confidence in who you are is placed on yourself, the value you have is dependent on your performance. And when you don't perform, psh, you pop the proverbial balloon. And you begin to question, you begin to doubt, you develop poor self-image and self-esteem. It's a knee-jerk reaction from I can do anything I put my mind to to I'm not capable to do anything at all. It's hard to believe anything good about yourself. Um, when I was young, I was in seventh grade, um, we used to play football a lot in the neighborhood, and uh, I thought, man, I am like next to the NFL, like Emmett Smith, look out, you know, that was back when the Cowboys were good, and um, 
And so we would play football in the neighborhood, and it took like three or four guys to get me down whenever I got the ball. I thought, man, I was awesome. I just didn't realize those three or four guys were two years younger than me. They were like fifth graders, and I'm in seventh grade. And I wasn't in the greatest of shape. You know, I, I'm ashamed of a lot of my pictures when I was younger because I was uh, about three sizes bigger. Um, I was a quite portly young, young fellow. And uh, so I didn't do a lot of running or a lot of exercise, but I thought I was all that when I was playing kindergartners, you know, in football. And uh, so all my friends were starting to play football, and, and I thought, man, I'm going to do this, and this is going to be fun. We're going to have so much fun. And, and I go, and two-a-days was an eye-opening experience for me. I uh, had never worked that hard in my life. And I remember one day we were doing this drill where we had to line, everybody was lined up. The seventh and eighth grade teams were lined up, and we had to go down the line hitting pad to pad each person down the line. And I was all right through the seventh grade, but when I got to the eighth graders, I was no longer feeling very tough and manly with myself. I got rocked really hard, and the next day I was all beat up and sore, and I was rethinking my decisions in life and what, what path God was leading me on. And we went to uh, our first game uh, was um, at a school in town, and I remember the first time I got out on the line, I was all excited, except I had a penalty called on me because I wasn't in place when I should have been. When they say down, you're supposed to get down and not move, and, and I did it wrong, and so I got a five-yard penalty, and I was like, didn't even know they called it on me. I wasn't even paying attention. Well, then the second time we went down, I did the same thing, and then my coach was screaming at me from the sideline, and I realized, oh, that was me. And that reinforced what I had experienced in practice. Like, I must not know what I'm doing. I must not be very good. And that became the message that was going through my mind. And after that game, I went to my coach and told him I quit. And I went to become the equipment manager, otherwise known as the water boy. And so this team I wanted to play for, because of fear and self-confidence issues, I sat on the sideline and watched everybody else do what I wanted to do. And this happens to us in so many ways. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe you were considering a promotion at work, but you thought, well, I'm not as qualified as that person. I'm not as good as that person. I don't speak like them. I don't have their education, this, that, and the other. And so rather than going for it, you opted to stay where it was comfortable. Maybe you were in a position where you weren't really playing your strengths. Maybe you got promoted and it wasn't a strength for you. And so you're, you're constantly self-questioning. You're doubting because you're wondering if you're just messing the whole thing up, doing a terrible job because you think where you should be is not where you are. And so you're continually letting yourself down by not meeting your own expectations. I felt that way a lot, especially in the ministry. You know, you're in a position where people come to you to ad for advice, and what you tell them often determines what they do and how their life plays out. That's some pressure. Believe it or not, pastors don't always have all the answers. I'm just as messed up as y'all. I just hide it better, I guess. I don't know. You know, but that's the reality. We all have these situations that we deal with. And many of you know this story that have been with Vertical Life Church. Um, when we surrendered, my wife and I surrendered to the call of ministry, uh, I didn't have much experience. I'd been a worship leader, but the church I was at prior to was there for about three and a half years. It was the first time I ever spoke publicly because I had a huge public speaking fear. I mean, the, when I, when I um, applied for the worship job with the pastor I was working with, I told him, I will do your music. I will not speak. So if you're going out of town, you got to find somebody because it ain't me. You know, I just was not going to do that. But God was working on me, and I finally got the courage to speak two different times. And after that, he called me to be a full-time pastor of a church, not really the path you tend to go. Um, but this is, this is what happened. I struggled with just that anxiety and fear. It took a lot to say yes to the Lord. I don't struggle with that as much as I did now um, as I did in the beginning, but I still struggle whenever new opportunities come up. Like right now, I'm pretty comfortable. I do this every week. But when new opportunities come up, I, the nerves begin to creep up. The sweat glands become overactive. And my wife will tell you, sometimes I hit the bathroom like 15 times before I go out because my bladder starts doing jumping jacks. I don't know. But, but it just happens because you have this question, this self-doubt. And I think many of us find ourselves in this place. And this is what Moses was facing. He was facing going back and confronting the shame of his past, all the inadequacies that he felt, the anxiety of it all was so much for him that he asked God, think about it, burning bush, 
angel of God, voice of God, and he says, God, can you ask somebody else? I mean, all throughout Scripture, God shows up, people fall over dead. Here I am, Lord, send me. Yes, use me. Moses says, I think you got the wrong guy. Pick somebody else. I think many of us are in that place in a lot of ways. We've had God encounters. There's been times God's spoken to your heart. You felt that unction from the Lord to do something, but all the fear, the doubt, the questions, the self-image, the self-confidence has gotten in the way, and you proverbially ask God, please choose someone else. Maybe you didn't say the words, but by not acting on what he asked you to do, you said it with your action. Not me, God. Ask somebody else. And this is partly why I believe God gave Moses the name he did to use when he went back to Israel. This is the most holy name. When you talk to a Jewish person, they will not utter this name for fear of breaking the commandment that says don't use the name of the Lord in vain. They will not speak this name. When they write the name in print, they purposely misspell it by adding vowels to keep from violating the command. This is the most holy name of God in Scripture in the Old Testament, the name Yahweh. And there is a reason why I believe that this is why God gave this name to Moses. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, God tells Moses, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, their forefathers, as God Almighty. This is the Hebrew name El Shaddai. Whenever you read about God in the Old Testament prior to this moment, whenever it refers to the Lord or God, it is El Shaddai, God Almighty. This is who he was revealed to these people. But now this name, he says, but my name, the Lord, anytime you see in the English translation, the word Lord capitalized, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is the name Yahweh. I have revealed my name, Yahweh, the Lord, to you. I did not make myself known to them in this name. Every major revelation of God comes with a new name and a new understanding of who God is. First, El Shaddai. The God Almighty, now it is Yahweh. The name Yahweh, the prefix is Yah, which means he, and Hayah, which is to exist. When he says, I am that I am, it means I exist to exist. I am the all-existing one, the, the existing one. Before me, there was nothing. After me, there should be nothing after. I exist. I'm the eternal God. And what's interesting about this name is that it only consists of four letters, the uh, ph- philosophers and theologians have created a fancy Greek word for this name called tetragrammaton. It means four letters. It's, I don't know why you couldn't say four letters, but it makes them feel smart to use Greek words, I think. But it's four letters long. And what's, uh, when I realized this, when I found this revelation as I was studying, this floored me to no end because the Hebrew language is actually a lot like our God. Our God is a triune God. It is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Is what we understand of God. Well, the Hebrew language is also three languages in one. It is a phonetic language, a language you speak. It is a pictographic language that uses pictures to represent ideas. And it's also a numerical language. It's numbers associated with each letter. It's fascinating. And so I want to show you a graphic that is representative of this name. So here are the three languages. At the top, you have the pictographic language. In the middle, you have the numerology. In the bottom, you have the phonetic. Now, Hebrew language reads from left or right to left rather than left to right than we do in the Hebrew language. So if you were to read this, you would start over here and work this way. So it's Y-H-V-H, or yod Hey vav Hey. This is the name Yahweh. And what is fascinating about this is that it doesn't just mean to exist or all existing one, but there is a deeper meaning that God reveals to us in this passage, in this name. The first letter, as you can see, kind of looks like an L laying down with a V connected to it. That is the letter Yod. Somebody say Yod. It's important. The letter Yod means it is an arm or a hand as a picture, and you can look through the ancient text and see how it kind of morphed over the centuries, but it is an arm or a hand And this letter means work or mighty deed or worship. This is what this letter means. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 34, the scripture says this, Has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation 
by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by, what's that say, beloved? By a mighty and an outstretched, this is Yod. It's a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, of all of which the Lord, Yahweh, your God, did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So that is Yod. Let's put the graphic back up there. The next letter looks like the guy going like this. This is the word hey. Somebody say hey. The word hey means to behold or revelation, to be revealed, something to behold or revelation to receive. It, it is a guy worshiping, uh, in, in worshiping the Lord our God. The third letter is the letter Vav. Somebody say Vav. It is depicted as an iron nail. This is an iron nail. Of course, in this graphic, in the, the, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see as it morphed over time, the nail is more pronounced. But this is an iron nail, and it means to secure. So this is yod Hey vav Hey. This is the, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm to behold, to reveal, the iron nail, and then to behold and to reveal. And as he is revealing this name to Moses, when you look at the pictograph and what it actually means, what it's saying is, behold the hand, behold the nail. This is my name, the name that shall be known for all generations. And it means behold the hand, behold the nail. Are you seeing it? We switch to the numerology. Each number has a prophetic revelation. The number 10 represents a divine period of time in Scripture. You can see the number 10 associated with many different events, referring to a divine period of time. The number 5 is always associated with God's grace. So you have a divine period of time. You have God's grace. The number 6 represents the fallen state of man, man in his sinful condition. And so when you follow the sequence, you have a divine period of time. We're, we're in God's grace upon the fallen nature of man, he will bestow grace. yod Hey, vav Hey. How will he bestow it? With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm secured by a nail. It's amazing. Now, if you think, well, that's often, that's just coincidence, Pastor Joey, okay. Well, you can also add numbers together. If you do the math, the number is 26. But that number doesn't exist in the Hebrew language. You have to separate it to two entities, the number 20 and the number 6. Let's throw up the next graphic. We got it there. The number 20 is the letter Kaf. Somebody say Kaf. The letter Kaf is represented in the pictogram by an open palm. This is to bestow or receive a blessing. To bestow or receive a blessing. And the number 20 is separated as 10 and 10. That's two divine periods of time. Two separate divine periods of time. So you have the number 20, which is kaf, and that's also the prefix to a word called kippur, which Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. It's the highest holy day in the nation of Israel. It is the one day a year that the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, and offer a sacrifice that would annul the sins of the people for the next year. It's the highest holy day where this priest would go in. So kaf is the prefix to that word. So it's also associated with redemption and atonement. And so there are two divine periods of time where God would bring redemption. 20 and then the number 6 upon man, the fallen nature of man. When did God do that? Well, the first he came and he delivered Israel and brought the law. The second time he came with an open hand and a nail, and he delivered mankind through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What an amazing revelation. What I love here is in John 1, 15 through 17, Jesus, it is said about Jesus, it says, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. Talking about Jesus being preexistent, he is the preeminent God Almighty, He's talking about the revelation that Jesus was before time. In verse 16, he says, From his fullness, meaning Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
This is the revelation. When you look at yod Hey vav Hey 10, 5, 6, 5, you have in a divine period of time where God's grace would be poured out on man, uh, his abundant grace, grace upon grace. 20, two different time periods, the old and new covenants where God would bestow his divine grace. And how would he do it? By securing the hand with the nail. The law brought revelation of sin, but the cross brought the revelation of grace, a true revelation to behold. So we have the open palm that opens up the blessing of atonement for sinful man. And how does it do it? Through the divine period of time, beginning with Moses and culminating with Christ. Embedded in the very name God gives Moses, the most holy name, is this revelation of himself. A prophetic revelation and declaration of who was to come, who was to reveal his true atonement and sacrifice. So, beloved, who was it with, Je- with Moses in the fiery bush? It says, the angel of the Lord came, and as God was speaking, and he revealed, this is my name. I am that I am. Yahweh has sent you to the people of Israel. Who was with Moses in the fiery bush? It was yod heh vav heh. It was Jesus, our Lord. The one who demonstrated with his mighty hand and his outstretched arm through the piercing of his hand with a nail, that he is Lord, our Lord. And just as Jesus told Moses, I am, in response to all of his objections to why he couldn't serve the Lord and fulfill his purpose in light of all of his insecurities, Yahweh told him, I am that I am, and this I am will be with you. I'll be with you. And Jesus has said the same thing to you and me. In the New Testament, through story and account of Paul's affliction as he's praying for healing in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Each time he said, talking about Jesus, replying to Paul, he says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. The word weakness means want of strength. It means infirmity, either physically or emotionally or spiritually. The grace that God bestows is sufficient to overcome any insecurity or any lack that we have. Moses said he couldn't talk as if this was a surprise to God. And Yahweh's response was, yeah, I know. I made you that way. He's saying, I can't serve you, God. I have this problem. He's like, I know. I made you that way. That's why I am will be with you. I am will be with you. Jesus is telling us the grace that I give, this grace upon grace, this double portion of grace will make the difference. And what is this grace? It's his presence in us if you've called on the name of Jesus. If you're a child of God, you've you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This grace upon grace is his presence in you. First, it's forgiveness of sin and of being absolved of everything you've ever done or will do through the mighty blood of Jesus Christ. But then secondly, it's being born again through the reception of the Holy Spirit in you where the Word of God says he fills our heart with the love of God and our hearts cry out, Abba, Father, because we have this new relationship with the Lord our God. Or he is father, and we are son, and we are daughter. It's grace upon grace, and we will never be separated. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll never think badly of you, and I will never abandon you. Jesus is saying, this grace I give you will make the difference in your life. It's my presence in you. And though you may be weak, I never tire out. I am always and forever more i'm the same yesterday today and forever you can always count on me i am the first and the last the beginning and the end i am your source i am your strength i believe somebody needs to grab this message today because the same i am who spoke to moses is the same yahweh god speaking to you today he is the difference maker When you feel lost, the I am is your guide. When you feel weak, I am 
your strength. When you feel rejected, I am your acceptance. When you feel alone, I am your companion. When you feel afraid, I am your courage. When you feel unqualified, I am your qualifier. When you feel hopeless, I am your anchor. When you feel depressed, I am your joy. When you feel anxious, I am your peace. When you feel sick, I am your health. When you feel confused, I am your truth. When you feel captive, I am your freedom. When you feel tempted, I am your way of escape. And when you feel lacking, I am filling the gap. I am the difference maker. I am your source. I am everything you need and all you could ever want. I am Yahweh. I am that I am. I exist to exist. You see, beloved, there's no calling you can't achieve. There's no purpose you can't fulfill. There's no battle you can't win. No task too great. No season too long. Because he has secured all these promises by the hand that bore them out. And the blood that was poured out for you. Just like that steam engine that lost his steam. I think Yahweh let Moses fall so that he could realize he couldn't climb the mountain all on his own. The mountain that was before him was too great for him to climb. So he had to depend solely on the Lord. He needed God. And that's too why we struggle. So we don't depend on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him so that he can direct our path. Just as Yahweh was with Moses burning in the bush, you know the Lord is your personal Savior. Jesus is with you burning in your heart. And what do you have to fear if Yahweh is for you? Who can be against you? Every revelation of God comes with a new introduction to a new name. You look through the scripture. Every time God shows up, there's a name that's declared. And this was the name that was to be for all generations. And because Jesus fulfilled the mission with his father, there is a new name that is revealed to the world. In Philippians 2, 8 through 11, it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. There is a name which is above every other name. The name of Jesus means to deliver, to rescue. And not only has he rescued us from sin and death, but he wants to rescue us from the fear that quenches our faith, that limits our potential that God has put in us and the reason why we are created. See, in Yahweh, we find our purpose. All existence stems from him. He exists to exist. All meaning, all life, all purpose is found in Yahweh, but the pathway is found in Jesus, for he is the way, the true, and the life. The name of Jesus is the name above all names. His name now has been elevated by the Father as the most holy. The lover of your soul demonstrated his great love by giving his own life for you on the cross. He gave his life. What more could he give? To prove he was committed to your well-being, to prove his passionate love for you. He poured out his grace that he could give us more grace. Why? Because he loved us. But just like Moses, God's not going to call you into something to watch you fail. Where you lack, the great I am will make up the difference. Why? Because you can do all things to Christ who gives you strength. Maybe you're struggling with something today. Beloved, we have a promise in Romans 8, 28. I mentioned it earlier. It says, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. If your story's not good, your story's not over. If your story's not good, your story's not over. He's still working it out. And he's with you through this process. So maybe you're struggling with something today. You can trust our deliverer to lead you out of that bondage. Is there something God's been laying on your heart? Maybe you know today you don't have a relationship with God, and you need to come to that place where you say, God, I'm tired tired of living life on my own, trying to be God of my own life. It's failing miserably. I need you. And he says, beloved, just surrender. 
Confess your sins, and I'll be faithful to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you'll become born again, and the Spirit of God will fill your life, and you'll be a new creation where all things will be past, and behold, all things will become new. Maybe you've known the Lord, and you know he's calling you. There's been something on your heart that he's been leading you to. You've, you've heard his voice, maybe not like Moses in the fiery bush, but you've, you have that unction that's been leading you. But all these voices have been telling you, you can't, you shouldn't, don't try. There's insecurity, there's inferiority. You don't feel qualified, or maybe you feel in too deep where you are, and you couldn't possibly change what you're doing right now. You're too old, you're too late, you're too tired. Maybe you're too young, too inexperienced, too yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. He is with you. And he's in the fire. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his masterpiece. Created anew in Christ Jesus to do the things he planned long ago. You see, Moses said, God, pick somebody else. Pick somebody else. And God says, okay, I'll get Aaron to help you do your job. He didn't skip Moses and say, okay, I'll go find somebody else. He said, no, Moses, you're it. But I'm going to raise up people in your life to help you. And know this, that I am with you. And this is why we gather on Sundays. This is why we're a part of the church. Because God is raising us up to help each other walk out the calling that he has in our life. To fulfill the things he planned for us before the foundation of the earth. There's not a plan B. There's not a second string. There's no one else that can fulfill your spot. God has been preparing you for a people he's prepared for you. There are people that God has waiting in the wings for you to minister to, for their lives to change because of the purpose he's put in your life. And he's waiting you to say yes to that call. And when you do, he'll be with you. He'll make snakes out of your staffs and many signs and wonders at the work of your hands. The adventure awaits, beloved. God's prepared you for people he's prepared for you. You know, when we were facing starting this church, I remember just being filled with so much fear and anxiety and just thinking, no, this can't be right. I must be reading this wrong. God, I don't think God's really speaking all the excuses that were being made. And, and so I called my grandfather, who was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, known as a straight shooter. Um, at his funeral, the pastor talked about a time when he was in college, and my granddad was like the rules police, you know, and now I see kind of where I get it. But, uh, but he was always a straight shooter, so I thought, you know, I'm going to call my grandfather, and I'm going to ask him, does he think it's a good idea for us to start this church? Because if I'm just fooling myself, he'd be the one to tell me. He'd, he'd be one to be like, no, you need to go back to school. You need to do all this and that. And so I called him, and he didn't answer, so it's like, great. You know, so I went to take a shower, and then he called in the shower, and I stopped my shower to answer his phone call. So I'm like sopping wet because I'm just like, okay, let's just get this over with. Uh, he's going to tell me I'm not, I'm not ready, and, and I'll have my answer. I'll be good. And so I, I, I talked to him, and I probably talked to him for 15 minutes, telling him every possible reason why this is not a good idea. And on the other side of the phone, he said, you know what, Joey? You have the Holy Spirit. You have everything you need. And what you don't know, you're going to learn along the way. So go ahead and do it. I'm like, that's not what I was asking you to tell me. But it's the truth. It doesn't matter what God's calling you into or what season he's taking you through. If he's with you, you have everything you need to survive, to thrive, to succeed. And what you don't know, you'll learn along the way. Today, beloved, turn to your deliverer. You don't need all the answers right now, but you do have everything you need. And you have the greatest teacher in the Holy Spirit. Turn to your deliverer. Call on the most holy name, the name that is above all names, to find the freedom, the healing, the meaning, the fulfillment, the purpose that he came to give you. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. So the call to responses, my wife comes as we begin to play and lead us in worship to go into a time of response. The call of the Lord today is come, lay your burdens down. Lay down your fears, your insecurities. Lay down your past, your failures, 
to lay down what's holding you back and draw close to the Lord. Lift up a sacrifice of praise because in him you're going to find everything you need. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your tender love and your amazing grace. We thank you for the revelation of your name. You are that you are. You exist to exist. You are the God above all creation, Lord of heaven and earth. And the revelation of the cross, the revelation of Jesus in the most holy name is such a powerful revelation to know that this is the one that is with us. You are the one we can trust. The one who parted the waters and led the multitudes on dry ground through the red ground through red the Red Sea is the same one who is able to part the waters in our circumstance in our situation. But like Moses, God, many of us have that fear that's standing in the way for us to take the first step. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would speak, and that you would reveal yourself, reveal your goodness, reveal Jesus in this place. That whatever you are calling people to do, they will not fear, but they will respond. In just a moment, God, as we stand and sing, I pray that if someone needs to accept Jesus as their Savior, they need to begin a relationship with God, to know their sins are forgiven, to know that heaven will be their home one day, and that, and that you live in them, God, that they would come and they would allow us to pray with them to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I pray, God, if you're laying a career change on somebody's heart, or maybe there's some big decisions that are being made, God, and this is a heavy weight that they've been trying to bear on their own, I pray that they would come. They would fall down this old-fashioned altar, this first row of seats, God, and they would just come to you, Lord. We know your presence is here. If someone needs healing, I pray that they would come and find the healer. If someone needs comfort, they would come, Lord, and that you would speak a prophetic word over their lives and that they would find that comfort and that encouragement. God, as we go into a time of worship and response, that you would reveal your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've got our prayer team up here. If there's anything in your heart that you need prayer for in your life, you need prayer for, if you need to receive Jesus at this time, I encourage you to come. Tony's going to lead us in a song. You're welcome to sing. I encourage you to pray. Pray along with those that are praying. And in just a minute, we're going to receive the Lord's Supper. If you need prayer for any reason, you can come. I just feel in my heart, maybe somebody's struggling with depression or thoughts of suicide. Just have an impression if that's you. God wants to touch that. God wants to minister to you. So come on and find freedom today. Don't, don't wait.
sing this together. Come on. This time, if you would like, come forward and receive the elements for the Lord's Supper. We're going to celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross, and we'll be dismissed.
Amen. Behold the hand, behold the nail that secured our redemption forever. Lord, we thank you for sending your one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, God, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, that in him we have life and life abundantly. Thank you for the body that was broken. The word says he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So, Lord, as we celebrate in remembrance of what your son has accomplished, we receive every blessing. We receive the body and the blood, and we receive it in humble and exciting expectation for the day he returns to set up his throne in Jerusalem for all eternity. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come and be glorified in your people. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. We thank you all for being with us today. I have just one passage of scripture to leave you with in my devotional reading this week. Normally I quote from the book of Numbers, a blessing in scripture, but I came across this this week. I want to leave you with this in Psalm chapter 20. And here's what it says in Psalm 20. It says, in times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. May he send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. May he remember all your gifts and may he look favorably on your burnt offerings. May he grant your heart's desires and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. And may the Lord answer all your prayers. Be blessed. And we love you. We hope to see you again next week. Thank you.